Hello and welcome. I am Piers Ridiard, CEO of the Decentralized Finance Protocol Radix, a public ledger entirely focused on bringing DeFi to the mainstream. This is our podcast, The DeFi Download, a show about all things decentralized finance and all things crypto, where we dive into the details of the projects, assets, and services that are powering the DeFi revolution. Today, I'm joined by Annabelle, partner of the Amber Group, a global financial services provider creating the Goldman Sachs of crypto to create a one-stop shop for people to buy, sell, structure their crypto, and earn yield on their crypto holdings in a highly trusted environment. Annabelle, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. So it sounds like a lot of things that you guys do. It'd be great if we could sort of just jump into the different project products that you guys offer uh, and and sort of how they work. Uh, and then and then sort of a little bit about the ethos as why you've created such a large suite of products and how it all comes together into your like long-term crypto vision of where things are going to go in the in, in the future. Yeah, sure. Sounds great. So I'll start with uh, our Amber app, the app, the mobile application that we launched just last year. And it's a, it's a simple UI and the functions right now include buy and sell crypto, the major currencies, uh, Bitcoin, Ethereum and stable coins. And then you can also earn yield on the assets that you have on the, on the platform. On our trading functions, in addition to spot, there's also margin trading. And we have this cross mar margin function where you can actually use your interest bearing collateral, um, you know, the deposits you're earning yield on as a margin collateral to open up your positions in volatile markets. So, you know, it's quite convenient, especially with the last few days where you can just see, oh, the market's dipping. I'm going to buy the dip. Um, directly without depositing more assets on the platform. Um, and this is just the beginning. We plan on rolling out a lot more features going forward, including, uh, including payments. Uh, we're launching our Ember card payment sometime in, in Q3 this year. Um, and we're very excited for that. Um, and just new features as the market and the crypto space itself grows. We, aim to be at the forefront of that and really deliver the best in class services to all our users globally. So with regards to the, the, the Amber app, um, you, you guys, you've re launched it quite recently, right? Like uh, last year, was it? Yeah. Yeah. Last September. So wh why, why does the market need another consumer facing place to buy and sell crypto? What does the Amber app like offer um, to the everyday user that, you know, the thousands of different mm -hmm. venues that you can do it in uh, doesn't? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So Amber, um, we as a firm were founded uh, four years ago and we really started as doing the, the institutional services. We run our own uh, prop market uh, making strategies um, and also service a lot of the, the, you know, the largest miners, VC funds, um, different uh, token projects in the space and really providing uh, institutional great services in terms of liquidity provisioning, in terms of uh, different trading strategies out there. And then last year, it was when we realized that um, with our ability, with our institutional great services, um, if we can platformize and productize a lot of those services, then we can offer the same high quality service to a lot more people globally. And that's what drove us into building our own mobile app and design it to be a lot more user friendly than uh, our web portal, which is designed for more sophisticated traders uh, or more, more institutional traders. And in terms of all the other services out there, sure, I think you know, if you want to uh, buy or sell spot, there's a lot of different exchanges. If you want to earn yield or do borrow lending services, there are also a lot of different applications. But for us, I think we are really the one-stop shop, like you mentioned, and we aim to be truly global, not just focusing on one jurisdiction um, so that, you know, users across different regions can get the same quality services and consistent services on our platform. And in terms of on a regulation and compliance front, we've also been working very hard on that and you know, staying at the forefront of that, applying for all the applicable licenses globally, and then really 
aiming to be the trusted partner for both our institutional and our retail users. So from a retail point of view, um, am, I, am I in control of my crypto or is it custodial or is it non-custodial? It, it is custodial at this point. Um, we work with um, the industry leading tech providers like Fireblox, um, also with BigGo on the custody solutions on the tech side. We have our own R&D center dedicated to you know, doing a lot of the, the research on research and development on our own wallet and custody infrastructure um, to, to ensure the security of, of our, our funds. You know, that is of the most paramount to us, um, you know, just keeping asset security. And what was the what was the reason that you guys sort of decided to go down that route with the consumer facing application, sort of the, the custodial rather than the non custodial? Uh, as as the approach, right? So I think this is this is the the C five part of our offerings. Um, mm-hmm. In the DeFi world, I think we we also have uh, made a lot a number of attempts. Um, I don't I don't know if you heard of Keeper DAO. It's sure. a project uh, that's um, incubated by Amber and also our partner Tai Young. Um, so you know that's. Uh, our foray in, into DeFi and our R&D teams also work with different DeFi projects to provide a lot of the blockchain solutions or smart contract solutions that they need. And we also recently um, hired uh, the co-founder of Peck Shield, Chachi Wu, welcomed him on our team to really add to our um, info security side of things. So, so we do take all of that very seriously. And I think the reason that we went for a custodial service at the moment, uh, which is separated from a lot of our DeFi efforts, is because I think at this point in time, a lot of the, the DeFi UI UX is still much harder to use compared to a CeFi route. And that's why most people default to using a centralized exchange or, or other centralized platforms. Um, so I think, you know, we are monitoring the development in both the DeFi world and also in CeFi and want to make sure that we give our users something that they like to use and is smooth and easy to use for them. So let, let's talk a little bit about that. So, you you know, I've had a play with your app and, and, and you clearly have been thinking about the user journey a lot and trying to make it as easy as possible. Um, what is it that you're able to do as a custodial solution versus a non-custodial solution that that improves that you think radically improves that user experience for the user? Like when you talk about it being difficult to use DeFi, what are you specifically thinking about? Um, I think um, less so on the the product features, but more so on accessing it. I right. think a lot of people are still having a hard time understanding the idea of keeping your own private key somewhere safe and then, you know, memorizing your seed phrases or recovering them. Um, we have a lot of users who are trying to transfer their assets from their ledger over and just panicked because they thought somehow they've lost their found, funds and then we've managed to help them recover that. But, you know, I think going through a lot of that, seeing a lot of that instances just proved that a lot of users just don't know how to use these you know non-custodial wallets to begin with and then using that you still have to interact on chain um so for a lot of the the newcomers to space that's just too much of a hurdle but you know they shouldn't be dissuaded in, into even just trying it out right there should be kind of a step in the middle that will guide them towards perhaps you know they'll grow into getting used to the more con- non-custodial services um and and get into the space that way. It's a really interesting like sort of path to take because I think that a lot of DeFi projects decide not to go down the custodial route. Like there, there are plenty of, you know, self custody of keys is terrifying for most <laughs> average users. And I talk, I often talk about like the um, in 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 inadequacy of the user experience of MetaMask or something like that. Um, but a lot of a lot of the sort of um, DeFi projects have gone down this route of non-custodial and, and using these interfaces precisely because of the, the the complexities of the regulation. So you're offering a a yield savings product within uh, Amber app, um, sort of 
16% per annum on Bitcoin and USDC and stuff like that for in, in some instances. Although I did notice that the yield curve was weird. I would get a higher interest rate for a, for a shorter time frame and a lower interest rate for a longer. <laughs> yeah, because that's, that's kind of like our, our welcome offer, like our intro offer, just like for a shorter period of time. Right, but from the but from the point from, from the point of view of financial regulation, you're selling a financial product at this point. You're actually selling a, a a savings a fixed rate savings product. So, like, and because you are the custodian, you are selling that directly to customers. So, how do you deal with that in, in the in the context of like jurisdiction by jurisdiction regulation for that? Yeah, and it's a great question, right? That's why we we are spending a lot of efforts into acquiring the the relevant licenses everywhere. To begin with, there are not even that many jurisdictions in the world that have put out clear regulations in terms of you know how crypto should be viewed and crypto finance services should be regulated. So to the extent that they they have put out something like you know the PSA Act in Singapore or SFC, SFC in Hong Kong and to some extent, you know, more more countries now that we are taking a very active stance and then engaging the regulators and, and, you know, making sure that we're correctly set up. But in a lot of the other places, it's like, you know, as much as we want to adhere to rules, we it's just simply not clear. And uh, the, the yield product that we offer essentially is sort of works like a bilateral loan agreement between us and our users. Um, they deposit their their assets um, with us, and then you know we promise we'll pay back the principal plus the the interest, the fixed interest, at the end of it. Um, so it's perhaps different from a lot of the other fund structures or the fund products uh, we've seen either in crypto or in traditional finance space. That's very interesting. Okay. And in terms of sort of like, uh, one of the biggest problems that people always come across is, is, is on ramping. So being able to go from money in my bank account to um, money in a product that I care about. How do you, how are you guys dealing with that? What have you, what have you done so far and what jurisdictions can you serve with that? Yeah. So, you know, that's actually another reason why this is set up to be a custodial service, right? I think a lot of the non-custodial services on RAM is perhaps uh, the, the largest issue because there's no reliant way for them. It, you still well, have to bring off chain. Right. Exactly. Right. That's, <laughs> like, you know, you have, like, oh, you, you want to use our application. You go over there yeah, and go, go sign up to, to Coinbase. Yeah. You still have to go through a custodial service anyway to do mm. the initial on ramp. Um, so, you know, we want to keep that all in one, in one place. And for us, we are registered with FINRA and FinTrack in both the U.S. and Canada um, for the money service business license. So we are, you know, we're licensed to take in dollar fiat. Um, so for our clients with um, dollar accounts or even basically any, um, you know, G10 currencies that can easily be um, exchange into dollars, they can access our services. So like in terms of servicing globally, how does someone in Asia on-ramp fiat into uh, Amber into the Amber app? Right. So for our clients um, who bank in Hong Kong or Singapore, uh, it's quite easy. They can send their Hong Kong dollars or Sing dollars to our bank and, you know, we can do the conversion for them or they can do locally, locally at their own bank. Um, these currencies are, are pretty easy to convert. Um, same in Europe, if you have pound, it's quite, it can be easily exchanged to dollars. In other jurisdictions, for example, China, Korea, because of the capital control, then it is much harder. So I think a, a lot of the users in those places would find um, another local providers to, to buy into stable coins. Um, uh, but yeah, unfortunately, that's just um, the, the regulations. Yeah, I mean, it's probably the hardest part of crypto, right? And yeah. it's like... Um, it, 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 the banking, like being getting banked as a crypto company is just incredibly challenging. Like even finding a bank that's going to go, yeah, sure. Even if you do all of the AML KYC and the regulator has given the thumbs up for you doing the, the process that you've done and you've got an external audit and all of this kind of stuff, it's still, it's still very difficult to find a bank. Who's like, yeah, yeah sure, it's, we'll it's finding banking. Um, and then also just going, you know, audit, all the other taxes, all, all the things that are constrained in a very traditional way. And then nobody understands how it can be applied to crypto is frankly quite frustrating. And that's why we are all hoping to see, 
on a regulator side, um, actually spending some time to 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 recognize crypto as what it for what it is, as opposed to try to fit it in either like securities or commodities, um, you know. So we'll see what happens. <laughs> Okay. Uh, and then from the point of view of actually building the user experience, like, as I say, on, on the, on the Amber app, you guys have, have, have thought, clearly thought about it being a user experience. The thing that I couldn't work out from it is who the target audience was, because some of the Amber app is like super easy to use. Like, don't worry about it. Don't worry about the product. Here's, here's, you know, a 16% savings rate. And then others of it is like, here's a, here, here's a trading view where I have, you know, candlestick graphs and, a, and I have a professional view on like what the spot rate is. And here's a way of doing leverage. And like, I couldn't work out. Like <laughs> it felt a little bit like it was split, split personality. Like part of it was going, oh, we're easy to use. And the other of it is going, you're a pro, you want to be here. And I couldn't work out like, who the audience yeah, for it is? No, that's that's a great question. Um, I think initially we designed it to be very simple, um, mostly for the newcomers, and we saw a huge influx of them over the last year. Um, you know, with with this bull run, it's just been mm. incredible. But then, because we were, we have been offering a lot more sophisticated uh, features. Um, so we thought that we can also add it to the app for for a lot of the users um, who are sophisticated enough to use that. And we're seeing actually even the more sophisticated traders they prefer um, trading on their on, on the mobile app as well, um, as opposed to maybe being in front of a computer. I guess maybe it's because these days a lot of people just you know are. are on the road and they can only access their their mobile mobile phone yeah so it's very mobile first and we thought that we could se selectively add some more advanced features for those who um, want to use it and we also want to um, like you said right we think a lot about user experience also user journey and user growth within our platform so hopefully the newcomers who came in six months ago and figured out what is bitcoin and bought some and now earning yield and with this you know the moves in the market maybe they want to try try out new features as well and be able to grow with our platform and with the industry with the market so you know, would love to see more of that as well Pretty interesting. Last question on on the Amber app before we move on to your other sort of uh, products and services. Um, how like one of the things that is always challenging, and I, I know that there's quite a few people who listen to this podcast who are running sort of DeFi applications or, or, or products themselves. One of the most challenging things is often user acquisition, um, especially in sort of like bull run time. Like it can be ex incredibly expensive. Um, per user acquisition, partly because a load of uh, the platforms prevent you from advertising, especially when it comes to things like trading and investment and stuff like that. So what's your user acquisition strategy and what have you guys found uh, to be a good way of thinking about user acquisition and what have you found to be failed experiments in user acquisition? That's, that's a great question. So this year um, I'm running our Global X initiative, which is a uh, a team dedicated to identifying different go-to-market strategies in different regions globally. Um, so right now we have a presence in Korea and going into the Latin American market and Turkey and Russia, um, everywhere with like, you know, high crypto adoption where we know that people are interested and perhaps need a platform like Amber's where they can do everything at once and um, know that they can trust a platform. Um, so, so, you know, the approach is, is quite different depending on the specific markets. But I think there are some generalized lessons that I've learned um, in terms of what not to do. Um, I think it's very important to, to um, not, there, there is not a general playbook for this market. And, and frankly, a lot of the more retail facing products in this market are very focused on trading and leverage trading. So it's very risky, um, encouraging very risky behaviors. And, and those channels um, are the opposite of what Amber should work with because our product is quite the opposite. We, we emphasize on, you know, securely buy 
crypto to as a portfolio diversification and then to grow and preserve your wealth. So it is really finding um, the channels that, that agree with your ethos and with audiences that are looking for the same thing instead of blindly going into those communities that um, just focusing on get rich fast. Um, so, you know, that's uh, definitely one of the things I've learned and a lot of times really is understanding the, the local culture and what the local users are looking for. Every every market, the needs are different. Um, with Amber, um, we're lucky enough to have a really wide range of services. Um, the the con is that it could be quite confusing, right? Because there's it's hard to explain what we do in one sentence. Uh, but a pro is that in each market, we can find um, the services that our, our clients are looking for. Uh, so to be our, our star our highlight, um, so to speak. Um, so it's really um, working with the, our local teams there on the ground, speaking to, to the user, speaking to the community and figuring out, okay, this is what they want. This is what they need. It's interesting. There's a, there's a great saying that I love uh, in businesses. If everyone is your customer, no one's your customer. Um, <laughs> yeah. And like working out like, who like who you say no to as much as who you say yes to like who who's the who's the person that you're actually really like fits really nicely within your definition of a product and service offering and that you can create a fantastic you know customer experience that transcends beyond the merely good uh, and doing that requires sort of a, a certain amount of, of of focus and dedication to that yeah i wish you had told me about this earlier especially in the bull market right it's hard to say oh you know this is the only thing we'll offer. <laughs> right. Uh, I mean, like we, it took us a long time as well. Like Redix um, uh, decided to focus on, on, on DeFi uh, specifically and engineer our platform for DeFi specifically only in 20, like at the end of 2019, it was before the DeFi summer. Um, but like it was it, at the time, it was one of those decisions that we just spent such a long time building a general platform and technology that was generally applicable to a large, like you could use it for supply chain management. You could use it for, um, you know, charitable giving. You could use it for finance. You could use it for this or that. And we realized that actually even, even every single one of these opportunities for, for these products are, is probably a billion dollar opportunity easily. <laughs> but if you don't focus in on like what your target audience is, what the tools they need are, how you can make sure that they win and succeed on your platform and create communities that are like our self helping, right? Like I, you know, I have a developer who wants to DeFi and then I have another developer who wants to do DeFi. They'll help each other. I got a developer who wants to do DeFi and another developer who wants to do supply chain management. <laughs> They're just going to continually talk past each other. Right. Yeah. And you've got that sort of like another saying that I really like from a friend of mine who, who worked at uh, McKinsey um, is um, you don't start peers. He said to me, peers, you don't start a fire by uh, taking your taking your lighter and moving it between all of the logs in the fire, you start a fire by keeping the lighter underneath one log until it st catches a light. And that's, I was like, that's right. It. It's like, that's absolutely right. <laughs> <laughs> the importance of focus. The importance of focus. Let's let's talk about let's talk about the uh, on the subject of focus. Let's talk about <laughs> the other products in the amber in the amber group and sort of how they all come together so like you start you said that you started in institutional um i know your you know your background of, of many of the partners at, at amber group are sort of traditional finance um uh and and that was your sort of your background as well um but like what 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 was the what was the starting product set for for the amber group and who was it targeted at and where did you guys find your first sort of like success there Right. So initially it was quite simple. Um, we were all ex traders and the founding team saw the, the room for arbitrage was immense in crypto, mm -hmm. in, um, in 2017, right? Compared to today, that was even the wilder West. Um, so, uh, they were running, they were already running arbitrage, uh, quant strategies on traditional equities and, and, um, other asset class, but they saw the opportunity in crypto and decided to pivot full time in 2017. And because of that, we've uh, spent time really. So, hang on, just just a sec. Let me let me unpack some of that because the financial jargon <laughs> sometimes is a, is a little bit dense. So, um, quant meaning 
um, quantitative yes. methods yeah. or algo or, based, uh, and, uh, yeah. algo -based yeah. strategies mm -hmm. where you have a bunch of rules that you run on the market to trade in and out of positions very quickly to take often instantaneous arbitrage opportunities between markets in different jurisdictions. Say, Correctly. for example, oil is priced at $30 a barrel in Japan and 31 in, in, in America. You have a quant strategy to be able to balance those two out and sell in the, sell in the expensive market, buy in the cheap market. Uh, and prop, so proprietary trading desk, meaning that you had your own book, you had your own capital, and you were trading for your own profit. You weren't, or, or you may take other clients' money but you weren't expressly going out and looking for people. You're saying, this is our capital. We're going to go trade on this. So you started with a bunch of capital and you had an opportunity to move from a highly competitive market from the point of view of successful quant strategies to a much less competitive market in crypto because it just hasn't been, it's just uncharted territory. The tools are less good. It's harder to get like started. It's difficult to work out the infrastructure. And so there's a lot more alpha opportunities there, alpha meaning high profit opportunities. Yeah, exactly. And and all the big guys in traditional markets, they are not even they don't they're not bothering to look at crypto because the market cap was so small back then. So you know they took the the, uh, the opportunity and move into to crypto, um, and really to, to capture a lot of the, the alpha that you mentioned and in, in the market. And to do that, you really need to to build your infrastructure to connect to all the liquidity venues, be it the exchanges and all the different jurisdictions and also to different OTC trading counterparties. So, you know, we spend time and efforts really, really building that and organically grew into providing services, external services to our, um, you know, our LPs or, or our friends or, or other people that we know in the market. Uh, because they'll come come in and say, hey, can you buy or sell this for us in large sizes? Hey, can you provide execution services since you already run algo trading? Hey, do you do borrow lending or structure products? So really organically grew into server, um, providing all those services to the market and really grew from a small pop shop into a much bigger institutional facing crypto finance service company. And right now, and, wh and why were people coming to you? Like why, why were institutions, institutions, inverted commas, i.e. I professional companies that are run specifically focusing probably on the crypto markets who have a balance sheet of crypto? Why, why were they coming to you and going, can you do this for me rather than doing it? Right. A lot of, a lot of our early clients are perhaps, you know, crypto VCs or crypto PE funds um, doing primary market investments. And when they need to accumulate a position or, or you know, sell out their position in secondary market. Uh, it's difficult for them to set up their own trading teams and you know set up all the access to all the exchanges, all the liquidity venues, and uh, oftentimes uh, they're either, maybe there are um, LPs or maybe just you know friends in the market, and um, they you know there weren't that many players um, in the market even back then and our, our team I think just from our background because we we did come from a traditional finance background I think people feel um, a, a lot more um, there there's that I guess trust built in it that that you know we'll do things the more compliant way which we do um, it's, it's quite obvious if you compare amber to perhaps a lot of our um, competitors in, in the market that we do do things in a more conservative way because I think that compliance training from Wall Street is kind of ingrained in our brains. <laughs> As, as it should be, right? Yeah. Like there's plenty of stuff that is 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 funky in crypto and how people sort of behave. Yeah, um, it's important the, to have so that just, bottom line somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right it's important to understand why like often this the, the these lines are put in the sand because of you know moral hazard uh, more than anything else and like being able to make sure that you're set up to to avoid that is a, is is a good way of avoiding the kind of things that we saw in the equity markets in the 1970s and 1980s and we we're likely going to see stories kind of emerge about the crypto markets in in equally the same yeah. way but it's good that there's at least a model to bring across in how you should operate in a in in a in a, in a moral 
fashion while still providing a market service exactly um, just 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 to just to unpick a couple of your more more of your financial jargon there so lp uh meaning a limited partner uh in the case of a of a traditional funds not like lp in in terms of like liquidity the provider. <laughs> yeah liquidity provider so a limited partner in a fund is someone who's got a load of money and decides to put it into the fund so the fund can, can invest on their behalf it's a tax tax efficient structuring that is very common in the sort of vc and funds world um and then you said something else i can't remember what it was that i was just like oh that's a that's another piece of financial <laughs> jargon i should have forgotten it okay so you guys had a you you guys had basically had an unfair advantage you had a bunch of smart people who came into the market from the traditional space and and created a bunch of algorithms that meant that you were able to create a, a, you know um disproportionate alpha uh, in crypto, which is awesome. So from there, from going from this prop desk that was sort of trading very profitably for itself to attracting institutional clients, what happened then? I mean, we slowly build up a track record um, and continue to broaden our, our business line. So in addition to just trading um, large block size OTC trades um, or offering execution style trades, um, people come to us for market making services um, on their exchange venues or maybe for their specific tokens. Um, and then uh, people come to us to ask if we offer borrow lending solutions. A lot of the miners um, in Asia looking to borrow stable coins against their, um, you know, their, their tokens, their mined um, proceeds. So, um, and, and then, um, also, in a, in a derivative space, in a structured product space, um, we, I always say that if there's any structure you want to do, we can put a price on it. Maybe it's not good, but we are innovative enough that we're looking, we're, we're willing to, to, to look at a structure and price it up. Um, and, you know, I don't know if there are that many firms in the market that, that, that would say that. Um, so, you know, because for us, we're just very interested in seeing the, the space grow. Um, maybe in part to leveraging what we've already seen in traditional markets, but I think more importantly, where these a lot of these crypt, more crypto native innovations could go. So yeah, always just trying to stay at the front line. Interesting. And so, like in terms of um, market making, that's a, that's something I'd actually like to have just have a little conversation about because I think it's really interesting and it's often not really well understood um uh sort of beyond the institutional markets but like what is market making how does it work and why is it important right so when we talk about market making on the trading side uh, that's perhaps just very similar um to the sales and trading does and investment banks where you know client come to us for a price um and we we make them a market obviously with some spreads that you know with our expected profit, and then clients can trade with us directly. We are the principal here, and uh, we'll often hedge Sorry, out. Can you, a risk. can you can you can you de demystify <laughs> yes. all of that? So, like, yes. what does that mean? Like, what are you actually what making a market for a client mean? Yeah, so we're just making a price, put a price on anything that our clients want. If you want to ask me for a price on 100 Bitcoin, maybe it's difficult to execute that all at once on exchange because you're going to eat up the entire order book and your price slippage is going to be very high. But you can come to us and, you know, we obviously have our own um, liquidity and hedging venue set up and we can give you um, a price, an all-in price, and you as a client can decide to take it or leave it. Um, and you, you are facing us directly, so it's not like we are um, we are going to just be the middleman and then kind of route your orders to everyone, and you have to face so many different counterparties. Um, so I think a lot of that's why a lot of the the larger clients would prefer to to deal with us that way. And uh, market makers for us, we we are market neutral, meaning you know when. You are looking to buy 100 Bitcoin from us. We sold 100 Bitcoin to you, but we're not going to sit on that position. Uh, we will always um, immediately hedge it out and hoping to make a profit by, you know, having some spread uh, in the in the price difference of where I sold to you and where I bought elsewhere. 
Really cool. Okay, so in 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 the last sort of section of the of the podcast, let, let's let's sort of like zoom out a bit and um, talk all about sort of Amber Group strategy. Like how how are you guys viewing the market as a whole? And you know, obviously the market's changed somewhat. There's now decentralized finance as as a, as a whole subcategory that didn't exist in 2017. Um, and then there's sort of like more institutional money thinking about coming in. But like, if you're going to talk about the the Amber Group mission uh, or like what drives the next set of products you're building, like how do you how do you filter what opportunities you go after and why? And like, how do you think about the next four to ten years of the space? Yeah, for sure. I think um, we can all agree that the market changes so fast. It's hard to predict, you know, what's a new thing or where the next um, innovation or growth curve is going to come from. But for us, what we know is that, you know, we are in this for the long run and our products, our services provided to our users should be of that same ethos, right? We are hoping that we can help more people come into the space and stay with us for the long run, um, being able to grow and preserve their wealth in crypto for the long run. And maybe that comes in many different ways. Maybe it's just buying and selling Bitcoin or Ethereum right now. Maybe it is other tokens or maybe it is, um, you know, NFTs or other new things that will come into space later on. Uh, but I think the guiding principle is that, you know, we are not, uh, the leverage exchanges where the average lifetime of a user spans from uh, one to three months. For us, we hope it's, you know, 10 years, 30 years. We hope it's, um, you know, multi-generations because I think, you know, crypto is only, is here to stay and it's only at the very, very beginning. And um, we will stay vigilant and be on top of all the new trends that come out so we can better educate our clients. But whatever new service that we put out there, it wouldn't be against our principle that, you know, it should be something that will help our clients uh, really stay in the industry for the long run. Interesting. And what, what are the sort of the macro trends that you see coming down the line that you think are important for the industry? I think it's always going to be um, short-term choppy and long-term, perhaps we'll, we'll see this trend up. And, you know, we get a lot of inquiries from clients. Oh, this is um, the good time to buy now. I have clients who ask me that since, you know, from $3,000 to 60 k and now back down to 30 And my answer has always been yes. If you don't, you know, if it's not a cash you need tomorrow, if it's something you're willing right. to put away for a few years. Um, right. So I think, you know, people oftentimes fail to, to recognize the long-term trend and just very focus on the short-term things. Um, and it's, crypto is not for the faint of heart. You'll see a retracement of 30% in an hour, perhaps. So if you're so caught up on that, uh, maybe it's, you know, it's not r the right risk profile for you. But for a lot of the people who really thought about it and think the risk reward is, you know, makes, it does make sense to them and willing to put it away and um, the best part, you maybe just don't look at it for the next few years. Um, then I, I do think, you know, it, it is a good macro, um, macro bed for, for these type of users. And I don't, I don't know. It's, it's interesting. I joined uh, crypto first, actually in DeFi and that's very early stage DeFi back in 2018, because I, I do see, the ability of the underlying blockchain technology um, that it could revolutionize traditional finance, the way that we do traditional finance from a tech perspective, it upgrades it. It doesn't necessarily um, completely change it, but I think it's just a better way of dealing things, just like what internet did to to finance, to, to you know everything we're doing now. I'm speaking to you right um, on the in the cloud, so um, I think. Crypto is so early. I know for a fact that amazing things will come out of it. Maybe I don't know what it is yet. Um, I still have that passion for DeFi and for a lot of the new things that will come out. Um, so I just, like I said, right, me and Amber Group, we just want more people to come in when it's early and really be able to um, enjoy the full ride. Interesting. I, there's, a, there's a wonderful saying, which is like people are short-term 
um, short term too optimistic on the impact yeah. of technology and long term too pessimistic. Yeah. And like you forget what an ex like you f forget the power of an exponent and like an exponent always like it, it at the start it's sort of like really slow and boring and it's only just go and then then it just sort of hockey sticks yeah. and like, wow yeah uh, and, I, and i think we're for, for me like blockchain and 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 and, and decentralized ledger technology is a more important innovation than than the internet uh, in that it will have a longer term, larger impact on humanity in our ability to organize around finance and our ability to organize around like create decentralized autonomous organizations around uh, that eventually may end up being how we run governments. And, and so those kind of things are really interesting, but it's very difficult sitting here going, yeah, this is how we're going to run the nations of the nation states eventually. Yeah. And everyone's like, oh, yeah, but like you can't, you can't even like send money into it. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like only drug dealers use it. So I think I think that this is, that that's changing slowly, but it's it's such it's gonna it's such a long journey that 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 sort of ten year, twenty year, thirty year multi generational view is really the only way in which you can win in this space yeah. um, because it's only by creating those long-term relationships will this space end up changing the world. For sure. 100% agree. Annabelle, it's been such a pleasure having you on. Um, if people want to find out more, um, where should they go uh, and, and where's a good starting point? Sure. Um, I think for the most comprehensive information, you can visit our website at ambergroup.io. Uh, and do you guys have a, a, a Twitter community or a Discord community yes. or a Telegram yes. community? Where do people hang out and yeah, chat? Yeah, follow us on Twitter at ambergroup underscore IO. Cool. Awesome. Thank you very much and have a wonderful day. You too. Thank you.